My name's Susan MacDonald. I'm the Head of Field Projects here at the Getty Conservation Institute. Uh, tonight's program, From the Field, Conserving Southern California's Modern Architecture, provides an opportunity for us to get a little bit of a snapshot of all the great things that are actually happening here right now in Southern California, and we're really delighted to be able to welcome our six speakers tonight, um, talking about six quite different but really fabulous projects. Uh, tonight is a, a little bit of an experiment. Um, this evening's program is powered by Petra Kucha, and for those that of you that have no idea uh, what this means, let me take a moment to explain it. In fact, none of this, only one of the speakers has, has done this before, so we have one person who's practiced in this, and the rest of us are really like, oh, we'll see what happens. <laughs> um, so Petra Kucha is a Japanese word for chit-chat. It's a presentation format created in Japan in 2003 by Astrid Klein and Mark Dytham, two architects who were looking for ways that people could share their work quickly and simply in public. And since then, the idea has spread to some 700 uh, cities worldwide. And I know there are probably people that, that have, have um, been involved in these sort of events before. It's something, it's quite common in the architectural community. So here on Petra Kucha Nights, creative people share their ideas, or in this case, projects with 20 slides at 20 seconds each. And um, if you want more information about this program and the Petra Kucha idea, it's up at this um, website here. So um, how it works um, is that you all have a program, and we're going to be proceeding in the order that the the presenters are, are written down here. And each presenter has 20 slides, and as I said, they have 20 minutes, um, 20 seconds on each slide. To <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> um, and um, only one of the ones that we had was on a loop, so we know there isn't a second turn round, so, because we've changed that uh, <laughs> on their presentations. Um, I'm not going to introduce each speaker in detail, um, we're gonna be, because we're gonna be following fairly quickly from one to the other, and we're going to take all the questions at the end, when we're gonna invite our speakers up to sit here and have more of a, a, a discourse. Um, so um, I wanted to thank all of you who submitted uh, their ideas for tonight. We had lots of really fabulous um, abstracts that were presented to us, and we just simply couldn't accommodate them all. But you know, if this great experiment works, we know that there's plenty of material to do it again. So thank you to everyone who um, took the time to, to send something to us. Um, the, the projects we actually selected, we tried to, to select projects that represented a range of different conservation problems uh, and solutions and um, different building types. So we tried to get a bit of a balance across different things, types of things that were happening here. Uh, so we, we don't want to waste any time. On, on, on. So without further ado, I'm going to invite Robert Chattel from uh, Chattel Inc. In to talk about his project, Medicinal Masterpiece, Rehabilitation and Adaptive Reuse of the Stewart Building. This Julia Schulman photograph was taken in January 1958 of the newly opened Stewart Company Plant and Office Building in Pasadena, a remarkable collaboration of architect Edward Durrell Stone and landscape architect Thomas Church for hosiery magnates Arthur and Marion Hainish, who were famous for invention of the bobby socks. Their successful pharmaceutical business was established in 1941 to produce a liquid multivitamin product and later the first capsule-shaped tablet. The Hainishes selected stone on the recommendation of Church, who had landscaped their Pasadena home. Also known as the Pill Palace, the capsule shape was used as a decorative theme in Stone's concrete block masonry, shown in the image on the right, where the manufacturing process seamlessly interfaced with the grand public space of the building. The company was sold to Johnson & Johnson for its product line, and the building fell into disrepair to later be purchased by Metro for use as the eastern terminus of the gold line. Threatened with demolition, Pasadena Heritage proposed National Register listing in 1998 based on exceptional importance criteria for properties not yet 50 years of age. By 2003, the remaining property not used by Metro was sold to a local developer and now begins the story of rebirth and adaptive reuse. Note how some of the original plantings, particularly the Mexican fan palm at the main entrance, survive in a feral landscape documented in these Habs photographs. The double height atrium space with 81 skylit coffers was intended to maximize employee morale and increase efficiency. 
It was a perfect fit for the clubhouse envisioned as part of a new 400 unit apartment community, a transit oriented development. Here in site plan at the lower level, the atrium at center, pool at right and theater at left surrounded by mid rise apartments. At the upper level, the front yard setback, driveways, parking and linear fountain are preserved and rehabilitated. A property line separates east and west portions of the historic building. In this significant space drawing, we established primary significance for the atrium, breezeway, and fountain along the north elevation and secondary and tertiary space, which is delineated based upon relative importance and alteration. Manufacturing space on the left was not classified as it lacked character defining features. The atrium in its as found condition, a long deteriorated and leaking roof and a damaged asbestos containing plaster ceiling. All saucer shaped hanging planters survive only because they were not e easily reached by vandals. At left, various pieces of original light fixtures are shown with our first replica globe. Code requirement required that the building have a full automatic sprinkler system where none previously existed. This was impossible to accomplish because of the hanging globes and planters. The green area without coverage in this reflected ceiling plan identifies one of the many challenges. The image at the top right shows work in progress on the reconstructed ceiling using traditional expanded metal lath and plaster. The globes and planters are now functional with fake planting hanging above and very real plants thriving in the ground. The shade pavilion in the lower courtyard is a stone and church design folly constructed of steel pipe columns and a molded plywood roof with paraboloid shaped saddles in these two vintage images including an advertisement for the American Plywood Association. Yes, it's painted metallic gold. The shade pavilion was reassembled in a nearby public park, reusing as much of the original material as possible. Roof saddles had deteriorated beyond repair. No one could mold plywood at this size, so they were reconstructed in glass fiber reinforced plastic. Note the elliptical shaped pool with its fountain sprays. These early images also include workers at the pharmaceutical plant who were encouraged to bring their families on weekends for pool parties. The Hainishes were truly enlightened employers. Again, applying the historic building code, the pool shell, including the waterline tile, was saved in its entirety and welcomed residents in 2007. Seated aggregate paving was accurately reconstructed, as was the east elevation aluminum curtain wall balanced by preservation of storefront in the North Breezeway. The first phase was closely followed by the second, a performance space for classical repertory theater, A Noise Within. The nonprofit raised $13 million to construct a 350 seat theater in the remaining west portion of the historic building on property donated by the developer. Remember that not classified back of house area on the significant space diagram drawn some five years before? It is now the theater sunk to the lower level. Jeff and Julia Elliott, artistic producers of the theater, are on stage during construction. Stairs lead down to the theater from the lobby, and a single story rooftop addition is set back 42 feet from the leading edge of the north elevation over the breezeway and fountain. The interstitial space between the trusses spanning the theater serves as offices. In a recent image at the bottom, the very discreet rooftop addition completed in 2011 is shown at night along with the iconic 400 foot long front facade patterned in milk white pierced concrete block masonry studded with gold knobs. The fountain moat is preserved, the lace curtain of the breezeway often described as a veil welcomes guests. There is an added glass guardrail at the landing, but do note there are no handrails at either of the two bridges over the moat, so watch your step as you enter. Great, thank you very much, Robert. Our second speaker is uh, Jim McLean from the Architectural Resources Group, and he's talking about the rehabilitation of Furnace Creek Visitor Center. The Furnace Creek Visitor Center was constructed in 1959 according to the design of architect Cecil Doty 
uh, who worked for the San Francisco office of Welton Beckett. Our rehabilitation project was completed in 2012 for a construction cost of approximately $10 million. Uh, many of you will be familiar with the Mission 66 program of the National Park Service, which really came into being in the mid-50s. Um, this is probably one of its early projects, but you may know the uh, St. Louis Arch, which is one of its kind of um, kickoff projects, uh, designed obviously by Aero Saarinen. Uh, this is a view from the highway in its original construction. This project uh, for us was a lot about climate and landscape. As you probably know, this uh, site is one of an extreme climate. It has the highest temperature ever recorded on the planet, 134 degrees Fahrenheit. Gets two, less than two inches of rain. Elevations range from 11,000 to 282 feet below sea level. Here's a view from a similar angle uh, from the road in its completed state, um, showing the improved parking. Our project goals were many. Uh, improve comfort for staff and visitors, make the energy and water use much more efficient, repair a lot of deterioration in the building envelope, make the site universally accessible, particularly uh, making the parking area more uh, safe for uh, pedestrians, expand the lobby, restrooms, and administrative wing, which I'll show you in a moment. We redesigned the theater, meeting hall, and the exhibit hall. And we wanted to make the central courtyard, which you see a piece of here, more comfortable and inviting. Um, our preservation approach was really uh, based on integration as opposed to distinguishing and contrasting the new work. We worked hard on the, new, on the roofs to preserve their original sight lines, materials, etc. We infilled a courtyard, that's number eight on the right. So in the areas number eight, uh, the blue above number four and three were the three additions that we made. Those are restroom <coughs> upper left, expanding the lobby, number three, and expanding the administrative office spaces, uh, number eight. Along with that, we made a whole range of material repair. So here's a view of the main entrance, the visitor's side. And on the far left, you'll see a slightly darker concrete block unit, concrete masonry unit wall. That's the only noticeable change on this elevation. Uh, we worked very hard to add thermal insulation to the roofs while maintaining all the dimensions of the sheet metal roof edges. Our sustainable measures were many. Uh, my favorite one is that we uh, integrated a evaporative cooling unit called a Coolerado into the HVAC system, which we completely upgraded using a chilled water cooling source. But that took great advantage of the dry climate. We, on paper, met lead silver, although the uh, paperwork has not been completed yet, so we don't have a plaque. Uh, but as you can see, we creamed uh, ASHRAE 90.1 by 45%. So some of the specific design features, uh, we replaced all of the window systems, which were single glazed tinted aluminum star front and doors <coughs> with double glazed. Uh, we think we succeeded pretty well in matching all of the original details, uh, profiles, and sight lines. So that vestibule there was added. That's the entrance into the library. Uh, sorry, the lobby. Uh, and here is a picture on the bottom left of its original design. We essentially expanded it to the right in the main photo on the top, about 14 feet, bringing back a, a ranger service counter a lot like the original. And as you can see, we really worked hard to maintain many of the original equipment and light fixtures in the ceiling. Uh, the exhibit hall is basically a black box space that stands alone as a volume architecturally. We completely replaced the HVAC lighting power. It's very sad that we weren't able to find room for this wonderful model of the Death Valley. Couldn't find room for it in the exhibit space. We created a new multi-purpose room. So here's an example of some of the other material interventions. We tried to expose much of the concrete block on the interior where we didn't have to worry about thermal insulation. But for the most part in this and the auditorium, any exterior wall, we added uh, panels, uh, acoustical panels, marker boards, and just furring to get pretty good R value throughout. You can see we left a little bit of exposed. The uh, sliding glass doors lead from the auditorium out into the central courtyard. This was a kind of a forlorn space, originally conceived to be sort of an oasis for visitors, never really uh, was welcoming and inviting. So we agreed to try adding these shade structures. 
Uh, we had to completely replace all of the uh, concrete paving. The stormwater runoff is very alkali rich and it completely uh, erodes the concrete over the years. So this 50 year old concrete had to be replaced. We replaced and um, restored some of the benches. And the center behind the trees is a courtyard, that, what was originally a courtyard that we enclosed to gain about 1,200 feet of office space. And again, all those windows in the office building were replaced, we think, with a pretty good match of the sight lines and profiles, but with uh, thermally insulated glass. There again behind the trees is the courtyard being closed. This wall on the left was in very bad state of repair, so we uh, repaired the block and the mortar. Uh, our favorite uh, feature of the building, this is the west facing elevation where you really have to work hard to keep the heat out of the building, but these uh, uh, porcelain enamel steel sunshades uh, were removed, restored, and repurposed in a new wall that was moved uh, about 12 feet to the west to allow us to build this uh, delightful little water station. Uh, and so in conclusion, I just wanted to say that anytime an architect gets an opportunity to work on a national park, a visitor center is a rare opportunity, and whenever you can make just a small uh, contribution to the visitor experience of those beautiful landscapes, we think we've succeeded. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Our next speaker is Eric Huss from DSH Architecture, who will talk about syntax and sensation, RM Schindler's Bubeshko Apartments. Okay, great. Thank you, Susan. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming out. My name is Eric Haas, principal at DSH Architecture. This is uh, Rudolf Schindler's Bubeshko Apartments. Uh, that is not a Julia Schulman photograph on the uh, slide, <laughs> but just as important, uh, I think. So, uh, though often credited to A and L. Bubeshko in many of the literature you would see, or even Al Bubeshko, the project was actually built for a Russian emigre mother and daughter team, Anastasia and Luby Bubeshko, in two phases, 1938 on the left-hand side, 1941 on the right. This is the context in Silver Lake, uh, comprising three connected lots. Anastasia knew Schindler's nearby Saks apartments and was introduced through her daughter's boyfriend, sculptor Gordon Newell. Schindler's first scheme was for a terraced building that would produce a Greek hillside for the arts salons envisioned by Anastasia's. Newell's sculptures figure prominently in the drawing you can see at the bottom. Radiant to be sure, but not his nor Schindler's. As an owner-occupied rental income property, cost was a great concern. Schindler would use common construction techniques used unconventionally. This is his original budget, which was rejected as too extravagant. It says $3 a square foot at the top. <laughs> as an own, uh, after a downsize scheme was built, Schindler returned two years later for the second building, yielding five unique units that share themes and organizations. Two units were subsequently divided and extended by Schindler over the years, yielding a maximum of eight. These now are some of Julia Schulman's photographs, giving us a good, although just grayscale, record of the project a few years after its completion. And that will become important in two slides. Our clients purchased the buildings in 2005 from the original owner, Luby Bubeshko, who was still alive, after convincing her that they would be stewards for the family's reg legacy. The buildings were mostly intact, but suffering, as is amply clear, from years of neglect and transient tendencies. One main goal for us was to rescue Schindler from the all-white approach that sometimes dominates our recollection of modernism of this era. On-site archaeology of the color history of the project yielded a palette of earthy tones. Those are the ones at the bottom, not the we created a model to test the effects of what Schindler termed color plasticity. Uh, here, colors with similar values but distinct hues to create spatial effects and not decorative ones. That's an actual model, not a digital one. We uncovered a systematic code in Schindler's use of elemental materials like plywood, plaster, wood, and glass 
which produced a matrix of individuated but related spaces. This would be the syntax of the title. Working closely with the owner, test after test was done to replicate Schindler's distinctive finishes using custom-built stains of shellac and raw Japan color pigments. The lack of lead was actually an issue. One concession to modern life did occur in our client's unit where a service porch was incorporated to expand the, as you might guess, limited kitchen. We used a blue recycled plastic countertop to match the historic kitchen tile. That's the area in back there, you can see with the range. And here you can see the results of all of our research. Luby was still alive during much of the construction and though she was unable to give specific directions, she did bless our results. The raw plywood barrier you see at the top of the stairs was to keep the client's young children from falling down. Uh, that's since been removed. This is the same master unit looking the other way. You'll see the direct extension to the rear yard, uh, which was really integral to this project. This unit has a more rustic woodsy quality with the dark stained plywood, a sustained supposed match by Schindler to the Bubeshko's piano. Just three years later in the second building, Schindler's design is much more planar in its effect and the color scheme much more subtle. Uh, you can't see any of the bottles, but that is a swing out bar uh, on the right hand side of the slide. And for me, this corner detail shows how Schindler was after big ideas and effects, figuring out specifics on site and on the fly. Nothing in the surface detailing around this corner or anywhere in the unit lines up or agrees with anything else, but it doesn't particularly matter. This is the 1941 middle unit, which is a subdued version of the master unit above. Uh, and here, the longtime resident was a heavy smoker, which lent its own challenges to the refinishing project. This is the north elevation, showing the still empty lot that Schindler never developed. That was the third one. He died before some schematic designs were ever implemented. And our office is currently exploring a sensitive complement for this property. And last, we like calling our project a rehabilitation as we quite literally made these buildings homes again. Our project is a model for the role of economy, creativity, environmental sensitivity, and integrity in the treatment of Los Angeles's architectural legacy. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Um, and moving to Burbank, uh, Mary Ringhoff um, for Architectural Resources Group will talk about preserving post-war signs in Burbank. Hello, my name is Mary Ringhoff and I work at Architectural Resources Group in Pasadena. And tonight I'll be talking about the post-war signs of Burbank, California. ARG recently finished a survey of Burbank's commercial areas in search of intact signs that were more than 45 years old. And most of what we found dated to the post-war period from 1946 to 1969. This is um, one very well-known property, Bob's Big Boy from 1949. It has Burbank's, probably its best known signage and it really shows the explosion of modern architecture in Burbank in the 1940s through the 1960s. Like the rest of the valley in Los Angeles as a whole, Burbank saw huge growth during the post-war period and it's retained a lot of its post-war signs. This is a ghost hot dog sign. Um, this used to be Papu's hot dog show, a locally beloved institution. It was founded in 1949 and went out of business in 2011. And the removal of its iconic neon hot dog sign um, was a real eye-opener for a lot of people about how endangered Burbank signs really were. Commercial signs are vulnerable because of the frequent turnover of occupants in commercial buildings. When a new business comes in, a new sign goes up and the old sign goes out the window. Burbank already has a strong preservation ordinance and a citywide historic context statement, but these don't really address signs as a specific property type independent of buildings. So Burbank's community development department initiated a project to inventory the city's historic signs, draft a, a sign preservation ordinance, and lay the groundwork for designating eligible signs as local historic resources. Everything was funded by a certified local government or CLG grant, which was issued by the State Office of Historic Preservation in 2013. 
Our survey methodology was pretty simple. We drove every street in the commercially zoned parts of Burbank, which is what you see in this slide. And we photographed all the signs that looked like they were more than 45 years old. We noted the address, the current name, and the sign type. This identified all the potentially historic signs in the commercial areas, and these did include a, a few residential and one church sign, as well as commercial signs. Then we did our background research to nail down the dates of the signs. We used permits from the city, and we also used assessor information and other sources. And this helped us to eliminate the signs that weren't old enough, and we learned more about the ones that we had, like um, there's, some of these had very detailed drawings, like this one from a permit in 1957. So we ended up identifying 79 signs, and 72 of them dated between 1946 and 1969. This map shows their distribution across Burbank, and it also shows that we divided them into tier one and tier two because the city wanted to record not just the fully intact signs, but some that might have been altered but retained some of their historic character and aesthetic value. There are 42 of the tier one signs. These all predate 1969, and they're either totally unaltered or they've seen, um, they've seen only very minor alterations. These signs are the ones that are most likely to be eligible for local designation. And as you can see in these examples, they come in a wide variety of sizes and types, from Larry's Chili Dog to the Lakeside Car Wash. There are 37 Tier 2 signs. These also predate 1969, but they've seen more alterations, and this has impacted their historical significance. So they may not be eligible for designation, but they do have value to the community. And if a Tier 2 sign were restored to its original appearance, it might be eligible for future designation. Besides categorizing signs as tier one or tier two, we noted their age and type, and we found five basic sign types. This is the first, the painted wall sign, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a sign that's painted directly on a wall. This is a ghost sign for the Firestone Tire store that used to be across the street from this building. Second type of sign is the wall mounted and facade sign, and these are mounted on the front or side facade of a building, anywhere from the ground all the way up to the parapet. This is the Melody, which is a 1960 apartment building that sits across the street from the Warner Brothers Studios. And it's one of the few non-commercial signs that we found in the commercially zoned areas. These are rooftop signs, which sit on a roof or directly above it or on top of the parapet of a building. And as you can see from the handy market sign here um, in the upper left, this is a sign from 1952. The tier one signs didn't have to be totally pristine. The sign has had some minor alterations, some of its lettering has been changed, um, but overall it retains its historic character. These are projecting blade signs, which are attached perpendicularly to a building facade. They project over the sidewalk, hence their name, and they're a little more oriented to street traffic than some of the other types of signs. They're designed to catch the attention of moving audiences, and they tend to have very dynamic shapes. And just so you know, that spider is, doesn't have anything to do with the Baron Hat sign. I'm not sure what that is. <laughs> this is one more projecting blade sign that I had to include, even though um, it's not actually a post-war sign. This is the Blue Room. This sign dates to 1936, and it's the oldest intact sign um, that we found in Burbank. And it, it really shows the similarity in styles between the, the pre-war and the post-war styles, but it has a distinctive 30s typography. The last sign tap that, type that we found was the freestanding pylon pole tower or stanchion. And these are freestanding signs that sit within the property lines of a business but aren't attached to the buildings themselves. Burbank has quite a few nice freestanding pole signs like these, and these include um, the Safari Inn that you'll see in the next slide. For each sign type, we described how it fit into Burbank's existing historic context, and we listed which characteristics and integrity elements a sign needed to retain in order to be eligible for local designation. This slide shows the character-defining features of the Safari Inn sign as an example of a post-war freestanding pylon sign. So at this point, Burbank knows how many historic signs it has, it knows where they are, and it knows how old they are. So the next step is finding the best way to actually preserve these signs. Like many places, Burbank is very protective of its history and its community character, but sometimes coming up with tangible preser preservation solutions is a real struggle. So the planning division drafted a sign preservation ordinance, which is currently under review by the Burbank City Council and is scheduled for a vote soon. The ordinance focuses on offering incentives for property owners to preserve their historic signs. And this is not a moment too soon since we're still quickly losing signs, like the 1962 Altadena Dairy sign on the top, which is now the 2014 Retro Dairy sign on the right. Burbank really has an amazing collection of post-war signs, far more than I've been able to show you in this presentation. And the city's sign project is proving to be a good test case for exploring how communities can better promote and incentivize historic preservation. I want to thank everyone involved in this project, and I want to encourage all of you to go check out Burbank's historic post-war signs. Thank you.
Um, our next speaker is Corey Buckner from Corey Buckner Architects, who is talking about the restoration of the Schneidman House. This is the Schneidman House as it stands today. It is one of approximately 85 houses built for the largest cooperative housing effort in post-war California, Mutual Housing Association, designed by Whitney R. Smith, A. Quincy Jones, and Edgardo Contini. The project began in 1946, generated by the housing shortage just after the war. A group of 500 members purchased 800 acres in the Brentwood part of, Calif of Los Angeles. This is the iconic picture taken in 1950 by Julius Schulman of the MHA model 301, the same as the Schneidman house, but unfortunately this one was demolished. The architects or joint venture, as they were referred to, came up with nine basic house designs with two variations of each, creating a brochure of 28 designs for the members to choose from. And here are the hip members of the community on the groundbreaking day. The members were primarily Jewish left-wing liberals, placing themselves adjacent to the well-heeled conservative community of Bel Air, and not without contention. The number of obstetricians and psychologists in the community inspired the remark that Crestwood Hills was the perfect place to raise a family or have a nervous breakdown. <laughs> The, the community members wished to create a utopia of houses and common communal land for facilities. The house lots were to be small, leaving the majority of the flat land for cooperative facilities like a nursery school, clubhouse, gas station, a building with a beauty parlor, variety store, and laundry. In the end, only the nursery school, clubhouse, and credit union were created as cooperatives. To create a feeling of more open space, the houses were placed at various angles to each other, which created odd-shaped areas between the houses for plantings to ensure privacy. It also created interesting areas for gardens and patios around the houses. Once the four housing tracks were created, the corporation Mutual Housing disbanded, and the community was named Crestwood Hills. This is the area after grading of the grading for 350 lots was completed. The first mistake the founders made was selecting a hillside lot for tract housing over the more desirable and cheaper option of flat terrain. In 1948, the grading cost a million dollars and required moving 2.5 million cubic yards of earth on 370 acres, a quantity not exceeded until construction of the 405 freeway. The first structure built in the community was a site office where the joint venture draftsmen and designers worked. The influence of employees and former Talies and apprentices Jim Charlton and Wayne Williams is unmistakable. The structure also served as the areas where owners could choose their house designs. Each house in the brochure was represented by a floor plan, elevations, and freehand perspective. Model 301 was one of the larger and more expensive hillside models. It consisted of 1638 square feet with a cost of 17,500 to build. The smallest house in the community was 775 square feet. The Schneidman House is an open plan with glass on three sides of the primary living space, providing breathtaking views of the city lights in Santa Monica Bay. The material palette is typical of the MHA designs and has exposed concrete block, clear redwood siding, Douglas fir plywood walls, and Douglas fir tongue and groove ceiling planks supported by exposed post and beams. And this is a picture of the Schneidman family with one of their two children in front of their newly framed house. The Schneidman children were raised in the community, attending Crestwood Hills Nursery School. Madeline Schneidman lived in the house on Stonehill Lane until her death in 2010. The house was put on the market shortly after her death. The Schneidman House is the house at the very far right of the hillside grouping of these houses. It shows the careful planning of stepping hillside houses down the hill in order to provide each house with a spectacular view. Architectural guidelines created by the joint venture call for no more than one story height from the street to prevent elimination of views and privacy. This is a house when it was listed in 2010. Alex and Kristen McDowell purchased the property and hired me as an architect to guide them along the process. The house was in original condition with the exception of a rather unfortunate addition at the front of the house in this photo to the right of the entrance. Note the window placement there and at the very front guest portion. This is the side of the house before the restoration began and before the tree removal and landscaping. The original drawings for the MHA houses burned in the Bel Air fire of 1961 when 45 of the original houses burned in as well. I've been able to collect many of the copies of the plans from original owners. My philosophy on restoring and or remodeling over a dozen of the MHA houses is to take the houses back as far as possible to the original plans and specifications until the client squeaks. <laughs> and that this is the house today. Alex and Kristen never squeaked. Instead, they poured time and money into the project beyond anything imaginable. All concrete block and wood inside and out was carefully stripped, and great efforts were made to match the original Clearheart Redwood and boat-free Douglas fir plywood. 
This is a view of the um, before picture of the dining area looking towards the living area. The original asphalt tiles had been replaced with uh, linoleum. Uh, please note that the, uh, the uh, black framed aluminum windows um, beyond there, it's uh, important to note at this picture, which shows that we were, they were carefully replaced by sliding panes of glass. Uh, the banquette was not part of the original plans, but something I designed to provide greater seating capacity in the dining area for a couple who like to entertain, and it was inspired by Eames' sofa design. The kitchen is a true labor of love. The layout is original. All plywood was stripped of white paint and panels that were missing or are now hide appliances like the dishwasher were carefully selected and applied. Molded plywood handles were fabricated to match the originals used in the MHA cabinets. The McDowell's selection of the Smeg, Smeg refrigerator adds another nod to the delight they shared in creating a work of art and preserving the house. In the study, we were able to see how the quarter-inch plywood walls were used as wall surfaces, wherever the walls were not redwood tongue and groove or groove siding. Since the Kentile Company had disbanded about a decade ago, it was not possible to use original flooring throughout, but instead they used a black linoleum with white streaks to emulate the original material in the lower bedroom area. This picture is of the living area and shows a dramatic roof that appears to float above the house. The actual flooring planks, once hidden by carpet, were in beautiful shape, so we decided to sand and finish in a dark, glossy, reflective stain. The original lighting plan for the MHA houses was eliminated for budgetary constraints, but the Nelson lights added for this restoration fit perfectly with the architecture. This is the last photo of Alex and Kristen looking beyond with satisfaction after the completion of the restoration. This photo is being considered as the cover photo for my book on Crestwood Hills, published by Angel City Press, coming out in conjunction with my lecture on Crestwood Hills at Modernism Week in February. Thank you. And last but not least, Christine Lazaretto um, from Historic Resources Group will talk about the forum. Fabulous again. Good evening, and thank you to the Getty for having me. Located in Inglewood, the Forum opened to great fanfare in 1967 as the home of Los Angeles' newest sports franchises, the Lakers and the Kings. In 1999, both teams relocated to a new home at the Staples Center in downtown Los Angeles, leaving the Forum underutilized, in disrepair, and facing possible demolition, until it was purchased by the Madison Square Garden Company in 2012. It was built by nationally prominent businessman Jack Kent Cooke and designed by architect Charles Luckman. It's new formalist in style, monumental in scale, with strict symmetry and classical details. It sits at the center of its 29 and a half acre site, surrounded by parking, but visible from the surrounding streets. Cook was a self-made millionaire who had long dreamed of owning a professional sports franchise. He moved to Los Angeles in the early 1960s and made his dream a reality. In 1965, he purchased the Lakers, and in 1966, he purchased a National Hockey League expansion franchise that would later become the Los Angeles Kings. The distinctive precast concrete columns, 80 in total, are 60 feet high and each weigh 57 tons. The Los Angeles Times described the Forum when it was constructed as a modern and highly stylized version of the Colosseum in Rome, and the Forum is often cited as one of Luckman's most successful designs. In order to improve the visitor experience, Luckman employed a suspended roof system that would eliminate the need for interior columns that could obstruct views. In the late 1960s, this was a pioneering technology that was not yet widely in use. And when the forum was completed in late 1967, it had the largest suspended roof system in the country. It's interesting to note that Los Angeles already had an indoor stadium when the forum was constructed, Welton Beckett's 1959 sports arena, seen in the bottom of the slide. But contentious negotiations with the operators led Cook to look for his own site. When the forum opened, the LA Times wrote that the sports arena had been the glittering athletic meeting house of the West until it was destroyed as a sports center in the winter of the forum's unveiling. As predicted by the Times, the forum instantly became a landmark in Southern California. In addition to its architectural significance, it's an important cultural icon and a place of collective experience. It was home to legendary players Wilt Chamberlain, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and Magic Johnson, and it hosted the 1984 Olympics. And of course, it was an important entertainment venue, hosting countless musical events dating back to 1968. All of the busy, biz, biggest names in music played at the Forum. Elvis Presley, the Rolling Stones, Bob Dylan, Led Zeppelin, and many, many, many more. 
To the city of Inglewood, which was known as the City of Champions, the forum was part of the city's identity and critical to the local economy. The 1999 relocation of the Lakers and the Kings and the loss of these musical events was devastating to Inglewood and potentially to the forum itself, which went from lauded to vacant in just over 30 years. Sports arenas present specific preservation challenges. They're large, purpose-built built facilities with limited opportunities for reuse. Their features quickly become outdated in terms of both technology and visitor expectation. And despite the nostalgia that people feel about these places, their preservation often becomes about aesthetics and the desire for something seen as newer or better. As evidenced by recent high-profile battles, this is going to be an ongoing struggle for preservationists. It's an important issue for advocates of modern architecture in particular, as the vast majority of professional sports franchises in North America were constructed after World War II. And many have already been lost, making the forum one of a rapidly diminishing resource type. The goal for the Forum Rehabilitation Project was to find a sustainable and economically viable use that would preserve the forum's status as a historic resource, but allowing for upgraded, upgrades needed and expected in a modern arena. When the project started in 2012, the interior looked exactly as it had when the Lakers and Kings left the building in 1999, which was largely unchanged from how it looked in 1967. Discussions about how to treat the finishes in the main bowl centered on how to honor the forum's historic character while creating a venue that could compete in today's market. This necessitated decisions about the treatment of very dated materials, including yellow and orange vinyl seats that were truly a product of their time. As you can see, it was ultimately decided that the seats could be replaced, but the new seats are compatible in profile and the original seating configuration has been retained. Other improvements to the main bowl addressed accessibility and life safety issues, removed hazardous materials, and improved acoustics, which was a primary goal in the conversion from sports arena to entertainment venue. Structural engineers worked to increase the load capacity of the roof to accommodate the demands of modern concert equipment. In these before images, you can see some of the original conditions, including the irregular pattern of the stairs, the lack of safety handrails, and the outdated features in the concourse concession areas. Superfluous secondary spaces like the locker rooms and training facilities have been reconfigured for the conversion of the building into an entertainment venue, and they're used as green rooms and other back of house space now. In these after images, you can see some of the updated features and finishes. Design decisions that reflect current tastes are all reversible. Original features such as the distinctive shape of the concourse ceiling and the light fixtures were retained, and the original textured ceiling has been replicated, and you can see an in-progress photo there. The exterior was significantly improved as a result of the project. The incompatible, incompatible metal parapet added in 1989 to accommodate signage required for a corporate sponsor was removed, restoring the simplicity and symmetry of Luckman's original new formalist design. Other exterior treatments addressed water intrusion issues and other deferred maintenance. Following a historic paint analysis, the building was repainted to reflect the original paint color. The National Park Service has certified that the rehabilitation meets the standards, and the project will receive federal rehabilitation tax credits. In 2013, the forum was listed in the National Register of Historic Places. It reopened in 2014 as a high-end entertainment vet venue, breathing new life into a beloved structure. Legendary Lakers announcer Chick Hearn referred to the forum as the Fabulous Forum, and I think he would agree that it is truly fabulous once again. Thank you. Wow, you guys were fabulous. That was amazing. I can't believe you all did that. Wonderful, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask our last speakers to come up and, and take a seat now. Um, in fact, we're, we're a little bit ahead of time, which is great, so we have a lot more time for questions. Just down here. You guys all did great. We were so impressed. Um, Jim McLean, looking at the Desert Visitors Center, um, it looked like there was a pool there, but was there water in that? Excellent question. If I had 40 seconds per slide, I would have talked about it. So that was the single most debated feature in the site and aspect of the project, and thanks for asking. So that was the centerpiece of an outdoor space that very much echoes what was going on in the 
I think, kind of residential school of design around California. We had this kidney-shaped pool filled with water with a little trickling cascade into it, and there was more planting originally than we saw in those pictures. So it was intended to be this kind of 1950s version of an oasis in, in the American point of view, from the American point of view. So what to do with that? In the, as I mentioned, um, stormwater runoff has probably caused the most deterioration of any of the natural elements at, at this place, so that was one consideration. And of course, in the 21st century, we we're um, you know, trying to conserve all resources, but if, in Death Valley, conserving water is paramount. And so everyone was in agreement that a running water feature was not appropriate, but that the feature should be preserved in some fashion. And so through a lot of uh, discussion with everyone, including the SHPO, a lot of park service people, not, you know, not just the park, but the Denver Service Center uh, staff, we agreed on creating this, basically an art piece out of it. So what you saw was crushed blue art glass to simulate water. Um, and we essentially restored the pool and its kind of head uh, construction. That much of the site concrete we're able actually to preserve. And I think I mentioned the um, paving concrete had just run its course. After 50 years, it was not even repairable. So we were re constructed that, and I think the contractors did excellent work. Um, does that answer your question? Okay. Okay. More questions? None? Oh, there's one, one up the back here and then one down the front. Question from Mary. How common is the signed ordinance with other cities? Is this on? Could you repeat that? Yeah, how common is the sign ordinance with other cities, or is it unique to Burbank? Uh, that's a good question. I'm not familiar with too many of the ordinances. Um, I know that um, Los Angeles has been considering an ordinance. Um, I'm not sure if they have a separate sign preservation ordinance. Um, and aside from that, I'm not really sure. So that's something to look into more. In, in general, I would say that most ordinances, they address property types more generally rather than singling out things like signs. Um, so in that case, that's how they sometimes get forgotten because people say, it's not a building, I can't designate this, I'm gonna tear it down. Yeah, please do. Thank you. So I'm, a, I'm on the Cultural Heritage Commission for South Pasadena and we have a sign ordinance. <laughs> okay, there was one down the front here, Ames. Yeah, I was just curious what, back to the sign ordinance, what are the sign, what was the owner's reaction to even finding out that they were, you know, on, potentially on the list? Were they excited? Did it make them nervous? Or was, what sort of reactions did you get? Uh, I, I don't think any owners know yet, but <laughs> it's, it's very important to say that this, um, this list that we've come up with, it's for, it's basically for the planning department to use only. These signs aren't designated in any way. Um, there's no limits on what any of these owners can do with their signs at this point. And this is something that Burbank, like a lot of places, is very cognizant of. Um, they want to be sure not to infringe on any property owner's rights. And so that's why they're focusing more on, rather than telling people you have to preserve that time, that sign, they're trying to make people um, more excited about preserving them. And so that's why they're working more on an incentive level. So they're looking at things like um, tax breaks, not counting the square footage of a historic sign in the square footage that an owner can have in a new sign. So conceivably, um, if someone comes into a building that has a historic sign, they can just leave that right there and put theirs next to it instead of tearing down the historic sign. Um, so I think once people understand um, that no one's gonna tell them what they can and can't do, but there are good reasons for them to keep these signs, I think owners will probably be pretty excited about it. Uh, thank you. Uh, a question to actually one or all. Uh, question is, uh, what if anything was different about your approach to these projects as modernist works? I'll start with a, a brief answer about the forum that I alluded to a little in my 22nd slide. 
Um, the tricky part, I think, in a building that we, like what we were dealing with, it was late 1960s. It was a very much a product of its time, not only in materials, but in terms of taste and the way things looked and the colors. So there was a lot more discussion, I think, about replacement materials than we might have had in, say, a 1920s theater. I don't know if that's a good thing to say at the Getty Conservation Institute. <laughs> um, but, and I'm not saying necessarily that we were advocating to rip everything out, but it really was a big part of the conversation. You know, you can't ask people to pay $300 for a U2 concert and sit in a vinyl seat, and the acoustics wouldn't allow for, you know, some of the original materials. They were looking at ways at, at updating all of those things. So, like I said, reversibility was a big thing, and we had a lot of discussions with um, the State Office of Historic Preservation about what we could do. I think I touched on this a bit, but uh, with the Death Valley Visitor Center, uh, it's, it's, a, it's architecture comprised of very disparate forms, and it's a sprawling complex with wings going all over the place, which is very difficult to expand and do it with sort of architectural soundness. And we did study ways to have kind of extending wings to, get, to gain extra space, but none of it made sense. So we found ourselves going more and more to the uh, approach of integration, really trying to put ourselves in, in the mind of Cecil Doty and what would he have done had he been hired to <coughs> uh, renovate and expand his own building. Um, so again, you know, we, we expanded the lobby, its entire wall to the north, and we basically uh, preserved that wall. We just moved it, but we, uh, re let's say we repurposed the lobby in a way that made sense with the expanded space using all of the original materials. I think for, for our project at least, uh, we tried to honor modernism's interest in risk and experimentation. Um, it's a very difficult problem, of course, to actually treat things very formally. Uh, at least with Schindler's work, everything, as I said, was, was built very kind of on the fly, very experimentally, very low budget. And to, uh, to try to approach the project in, in that way and to kind of honor the original intent of at least these res very, you know, sort of humble residential projects that went on to became, become institutionalized, um, I think is a really difficult sort of philosophical question that we wrestled with in our work. Um, and I still haven't had an answer, and it's different for all of our projects, but that's, that's, that's one approach I think we took. Robert or Corey, would you like to say anything? Well, about it, that? It, it always comes down to materials and the research involved with that, and I have to say that Kristen and Alex, who are out there somewhere, uh, did an incredible job of, of finding stains, finding things that were actually appropriate and in the specifications. Uh, it takes a great deal of time. And I understand the Getty is doing a whole, uh, what, research uh, catalog, hopefully, about uh, materials and preservation, which is desperately needed, I think. And, uh, I think some of the materials are particularly challenging for our building that had an aluminum sash um, uh, glazing system um, and it was boarded up for more than 10 years. It's, it's not easy to patch aluminum. Um, when you put a screw in it and attach a board to it, it deforms. You can't get it back. You can't sand it down like wood. So um, there are particular challenges with contemporary materials. Um, you know, I think we probably all experienced that there's a great deal more hazardous materials because they were being somewhat innovative, but asbestos wasn't everything. Um, and that's a particular challenge today. You know, we really have difficult times preserving materials when there are expanses of plaster uh, flooring that contain uh, materials that we're, we're looking to remove these days. Okay, and, and that's right. One of, um, under the Conserving Modern Architecture project, one of the issues with conserving modern architecture is related to their materials, a whole range of problems, the inability to get replacement materials, problems with their longevity, toxicity, um, and just how to repair some of them. And we just don't know enough, as people have said, about the materials, how they deteriorate, um, what potential solutions can be brought to bear on them. So that is something that we are particularly interested in 
here at the Getty and we're looking at um, expanding our work in that particular area and the first material we're probably going to start with is, is concrete and there'll be something up on the website shortly about a, an expert meeting that we had this year which started to tease out the particular problems associated with that. Some of the other priority areas we had identified was modern metals, uh, aluminum as you said, um, and plastics, a whole range of, of those sort of things. So. You'll hear a little bit more about toxic material problems, I think, at the lecture in January, if you would like to attend, attend that. So another advertisement. Um, okay, other, other questions or, or comments? Here? Uh, my question is for the uh, final presenter who worked on the forum. So much of what I've read about and, and heard about from people who've been there is about the amazing acoustics, and you kind of started touching on that in your discussion about the materials. I'm curious what was done to improve the, the acoustics of the facility. Um, well, I should start by saying, and I meant to say this in my last answer, that um, HRG was the historic preservation consultant for the project, so we were part of a very giant team um, that included a lead architecture firm, an acoustic specialist that they worked with throughout the project. So our role was mainly to advise them on what were the character defining features, what was historic about the arena. But with that being said, I know some of the arguments we were having back and forth were about some of the material choices. So, you know, I'm not an acoustic specialist and I'm sure I can get you lots of information if you want more detail, but a lot of it was about softening all of the surfaces. So you know, the arena was a concrete floor and all of the concourse areas had these um, terracotta tiles. So it was all hard surfaces everywhere, you know, plexiglass, hand uh, security screens, that kind of thing. So carpet is laid in all the concourse areas now. There are heavy curtains that lead from the concourse out into the concession area. They did put, um, I think they're called base traps or bass traps in the in the upper reaches of the arena. And that was one of the big conversations with the state office because they were adding a little bit of structure to the original um, structure of the bowl. So they were careful to make sure it wasn't visible and it's you know black so you can't really, I don't think you can tell if you didn't know it was there. There is fabric put on some of the concourse walls. So I think a lot of it was about softening the surfaces. Um, and again, if you want more detailed information, I'm happy to find out and get it to you. Hi there. Um, I had a quick question for all of you, actually, which is what percentage do you think of your practice currently is dealing with modern architecture, post-war details? How much of a, of a big part of what you're doing um, on a day-to-day -day basis is uh, our modern legacy? I represent the architectural branch of our firm, Katie Horak, Mary, uh, Evan, are all uh, historic historians and planners who do a wide range of projects, and many of them, and I think they deal with uh, many more modern structures than I've had the good fortune to be involved in. Uh, to do this level of uh, rehabilitation, really, this is my only one, and I'd love the chance to do it again. Um, well, I can say from our perspective, we're doing an awful lot of survey work of post-war resources. Um, we recently did a project in South Pasadena for Jim um, that we looked at the history of South Pasadena, you know, from the beginning until the 1970s, but a particular focus was on the post-war area, and we've done surveys in Riverside. We're currently doing some work in Palm Springs, so I think a lot of people, even though, you know, we don't really need to wait until they're 50, you know, cities are still kind of catching up with that, so there's a lot of work being done to look at post-war resources. I, I, I don't know what percentage of our work, but, but quite a bit. Um, and I think that the uh, trend for garden apartments, the Los Angeles Conservancy just had a garden apartment tour, um, and Los Angeles has a huge collection of those um, uh, properties, um, you know, I think is a growing trend. Um, you know, I like to say that preservation is a growth industry, so um, buildings are getting older every day, so um, we're looking at, you know, the great majority of buildings that exist in the post-World War II era. 
speaking from the planning side of ARG um, and currently engrossed in um, surveying the San Fernando Valley or big parts of it for Survey LA. Um, I can tell you that I, I deal with modern resources quite a bit on a daily basis. Um, lately, it's been a lot of ranch house neighborhoods, so it's not really modern style architecture. However, it is still the kind of 20th century resources that you sometimes have to explain to people why they're significant. Um, so right now, I would say 65%. Well, I guess the rumor got out, I would have to say 100%. <laughs> and uh, our practice is not particularly conservation oriented, but we're still doing probably a third of our practice. We've done several projects recently. And again, I think in part it's because there's so many great buildings out in Los Angeles. It's so expensive to tear them down and start over. So let's do, deal with them smartly. And we're dealing with a, a whole... Um, era of architecture that needs, uh, needs a lot of uh, love and care right now. So. so while the microphone's coming down the front here for the next question, I had a follow-up one that I wanted to ask you all that relates to this a little bit. Um, given that there are increasing opportunities to be involved in conserving modern architecture, more people are recognising it's important, are asking you to do these projects, how easy is it or difficult is it um, for you to convince your clients to put the sort of um, sort of legwork in that is often required in conservation, really good research, for example, historic investigation. Sometimes you need really good material analysis. Um, and in the past, it's been quite difficult to convince clients to invest in that in the same way that they might for a much older building. Given the sort of work that you're all doing now and the, the, the percentages of work that you're doing, is, is it still harder to get those that attention and those resources paid to the more recent buildings that you're dealing with, or do you think it's kind of pretty much the same now? I guess I have the mic, so let me, I'll start. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, I, I would say, actually, we've had a breeze. All of our clients on our projects have been completely supportive of, the, of our efforts um, and taking not as much time as we would like, but uh, a, a healthy amount of time and are very invested in it. We did a project renovate. Uh, with an adaptive reuse of a Weldon Beckett building and for a, uh, use as a charter school recently. And um, we didn't actually do this, but the uh, clients, the school was very interested in putting a bust of Weldon Beckett in the library uh, for the kids to, uh, to learn from. So very, very supportive. Um, you know, every, every client is different and I, win some battles and I lose some battles. I, I guess I basically win the war for the most part, but um, it's easier, much easier now because there are so many fine examples and certainly within our neighborhood of Crestwood Hills where I've done majority of work there, um, if I can walk people through projects that have already finished, it, it's, it's easier to explain why something is important, why a finish is important. Um, so I would say it's definitely getting easier. Again, I'll defer to Jim about the architecture side of ARG's um, practice, but from the planning side, um, it's not, in my experience, it hasn't been that much of a problem because the people that come to us are the people that are already convinced of the need to um, conserve these sort of resources. So whether it's um, writing a historic context statement for garden apartments or um, recording a, a thicket-designed residential district, uh, most of the time, um, we don't have to do a lot of convincing in that field. I'd add that as a historic preservation consultant, I think much of our work is about balancing continuity and change, and um, some aspects of that are no different for an older resource as to a contemporary resource, um, but there are, I think, challenges, um, and they're inherent in all these projects, and preserving the key elements of a building where you can't preserve all of the features and achieve a contemporary use, I think, is um, uh, very worthwhile. Um, I don't know if I have much to add. I think I agree with Mary. Um, people that are predisposed to preservation, I think, you know, modernism has now become part of historic preservation. People that aren't predisposed to it aren't going to understand it, no matter what the age of the resource. Um, it is very interesting, I think, when you're talking about things that are less stylistically important, like she was saying, you know, when we're 
we're identifying little neighborhoods of you know minimum minimal traditional FHA houses. People still don't get that. Um, but I think in terms of you know high style modern architecture, it feels like it's getting better. I think. I don't think I have an answer that's particularly focused on modernism, but what we find works in a lot of cases is to nurture a relationship with a client, an owner, whatever it is, and that can uh, follow a path such as you do some kind of probably free uh, visit to the site with the client and talk about what their aspirations and goals are, how they view the site or the building then you might do kind of an initial study. It might be a feasibility study, it might be a historical evaluation, and then you really just kind of go step by step and try to um, get a sense of how committed you think you can get this client to become. Um, and it often works if there's kind of genuine honesty and commitment on both sides, and there are gonna be cases where it doesn't work. Um, this is a question for Eric. Um, you talked about a syntax of color in the apartments, and uh, I'd like to hear a bit more about that. I mean, the sort of conventional wisdom among philosophers of art is that uh, music has got a syntax to it, but color doesn't. But maybe color in context and in space and function does, and I'd be interested to hear more about the sense in which you think there's a kind of syntax of color in this house. I think, we, you know, we, um, the Bubeshko Apartments is a little bit of a unique project for Schindler. Actually, I don't think there is a project of Schindler's that isn't unique at some level. Um, he's an incredible shapeshifter, so I can really only speak with great authority about this project in, this, in these terms, but um, for me, for us, I mean, in terms of discovering the kind of, um, this the kind of, um, the, the, the uniqueness of each apartment um, that were uh, related through this kind of code of materiality, and that's what I mean, that there's a kind of, there's a kind of syntax behind the sort of structure of the way that, in which he does things. Each individual, I mean, like language, those of you who may have have a little post-structural theory, <laughs> whatever, um, might understand the, the you know the interest in in the kind of uh, specifics of of the uh, spaces are actually held together by that structure, and you know for us I mean that kind of Schindler's kind of theory about color being an actual plastic material, not a surficial thing, but actually a sort of a tangible, uh, physically present. Uh, factor within the creation of architecture was really sort of fascinating to us. I don't know if it's completely uh, convincing in, uh, in effect, but I think the idea of actually use something that is something that is uh, considered as sort of intangible and, or ephemeral uh, and shifting uh, um, uh, element within the architectural field as a, and using it as, as matter was, was really what we were trying to kind of study. Hi, um, living in California, I know we all think about earthquakes a lot, so I was wondering if any of you had any challenges related to seismic concerns. I'll take one stab at it. Uh, that's a really good question. I think the architects that work on modern structures, uh, and this was the case in the Death Valley buildings, uh, find that often the kind of original architectural concept is based on some kind of simplicity of structure, and that's a big part of the expressiveness of the architecture. That leaves uh, very little concealed space in which one can mm, situate reinforcing elements. Uh, so that, that is a big challenge, I think, on modern structures. I, I would imagine if we had more time to learn about the forum that there were some very ingenious solutions to that. On our project that I showed you, we had some very minor reinforcement required. We were able to conceal it. Okay. <laughs> no one else wants to go seismic? No. <laughs> well, I, I can just say we were lucky enough to have one of the few Schindler buildings that had really good foundations. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I could add one, actually. Uh, 
the houses in Crestwood Hills were actually designed really well, and, and starting from the plan, I mean, very intricate plans on the foundations. So in the, uh, uh, what was the latest big earthquake, there was only one, one house that had a cracked glass. So it's either an incredibly stable hill or those houses are very well designed. Okay. Well, we just get to have a drink a little bit earlier. That's absolutely fine. <laughs> um, I would just like to, to thank our speakers very much for us really challenging them tonight and putting them on the spot and, and um, joining in the fun of, of our experiment. I think it worked really well. I absolutely loved it. Thank you all so much. Um, it was brilliant. <laughs>